Hello everyone this is part 12 of what if Naruto was a puppeteer, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Fighting Mikade was becoming tiresome. It wasn't that the guy was particularly tough, the opposite in fact. In this form he was lumbering and awkward, clearly unused to his many appendages. It was child's play for Naruto to confuse him, simply by having his puppets move around him in wide arcs, peppering him with fire. It was the fact that, despite how easy it should have been, the man just wouldn't go down. He moved Ramya around, making sure she was positioned in front of Mukid's face before letting loose with a diffuse blast from the sand cannon. The reserves were getting low, so he couldn't afford to use it as a cutting tool anymore. Instead he spread a wide cloud of sand to distract the man, giving Minato enough time to come down on his head from behind with another of his swirly chakra techniques. Those things were particularly devastating, and combined with the man's more famous technique, Naruto could see how he earned his reputation. Or, he would at least. The battle that gave him the moniker Yellow Flash was in the closing days of the Third Shinobi War. Time travel hurt his head. Mikade roared angrily, groping blindly as Naruto had expected him to. The moment any of his hands touched a surface, Arakun was there, sticking them in place with her adhesive. It never held the puppet creature thing for long, and often he would rip out chunks of the floor and ceiling to free himself, but anything that worked as a delaying tactic was welcome. They just needed to keep this brute busy until Sarah could close the Ryamyaku. Then he would be vulnerable and Naruto could repay this irritation tenfold. You pests, Mikade called, ripping one of his arms free of the hand, although irritatingly regenerating it moments later, and slamming down hard on the floor, a growing to be a nuisance. The entire room shook, bits of loose masonry and machinery falling around them. Naruto was forced to dodge out of the way of a chunk of stone and was blindsided by one of Mukid's factory-made puppets. Luckily, Minato was a lot nimbler than he was and was already there, crushing the wooden construct with his technique. Naruto worried about that, pure chakra manipulation couldn't be as simple as the man made it look, and he was throwing around those, raising gun, like they were kunai. Sure enough, the man had to take a moment to collect himself before turning to Naruto. This isn't working. He was right. Despite their best efforts, Mikade continued to push forward. At the civilian pace Sarah was limited to, if they wavered for even a moment he would blast right past them and catch her in no time. Hanata may have grown stronger, but he still didn't think she would fare much better than the both of them. I need a distraction, Naruto muttered, grimacing at the stupid thing he was about to do. Minato nodded without even questioning him, darting back towards the rampaging puppeteer and drawing a few of his unique kunai. Shuriken cage bunshin no jutsu. He called, and the five or so kunai multiplied into hundreds in an instant, tearing into Mikade like he was facing down an entire company of shinobi. It was perfect. The moment the man puppet thing reeled back in pain and anger, Naruto threw his hand forward, latching on with every chakra string his could conjure. Soen, Jasu, his arm tensed as he felt the immediate backlash. There it was again, the immense pressure of the Ryamyaku, fighting against his technique. The bright blue lines of his strings started to shift, infected by that purple energy that slowly crept back down towards him from Mikade. The insect-looking man, still mostly immobilized from Minato's barrage, grinned spitefully. You fool. You think you could overpower me. I have the power of a dragon coursing through my veins. Naruto said nothing, couldn't, he was concentrating too hard. One part of his mind focused on his technique, fighting the inevitable tide of the Ryamyaku. The other looked inwards, digging deep within himself and looking for that elusive spark of. His eyes widened as he cried out, flames of vicious, putrid energy rushing from his core. His whole body burned, pain seeping up into his chest, along his arm, down his fingertips. All of a sudden, his chakra strings turned bright orange, casting the room as if it were aflame. It met the energy of the Ryamyaku and pushed, driving the alien energy back towards Mikade. The puppeteer could only look on his shock and horror. He wasn't the only one. Naruto wasn't controlling this anymore. The Kyuubi's chakra seemed to have a mind of its own, did have a mind of its own. It whispered in his ear as that burn spread through the rest of his body, tinting the world a dark red. Kill, destroy, 
Rampage, it whispered, and Naruto was terrified to note how enticing it all sounded, how good it would feel to simply let go and give over control to this noxious, intoxicating power. It was too much. Fighting off the QB and the Ryumyaku threatened to tear him in two. He pulled back, forcefully reining that energy in. It took all of his considerable willpower to even manage that much, and the effort left him barely standing when the chakra strings detached from Mikade. Still, it had done something. The puppet thing was looking at him far more warily now, cautious of that power that could even rival the Ryumyaku. Even Minato was stunned, looking at Naruto as though he couldn't believe his eyes. That was. We don't need to talk about what that was, okay. Naruto shot back tersely. He hadn't even considered what revealing his Jinchuriki status might do to the timeline. The older ninja seemed conflicted, eyes flickering between Naruto's spiky blonde hair and the thin whisker marks on his cheeks, before nodding grimly, turning back to their opponent. I didn't give you enough credit Kanoa Nin. It seems I'll have to take you more seriously. Puppets from around the room suddenly jerked to life. Instead of attacking the two tired shinobi, they lurched towards Mikade, disassembling themselves mid-flight. Where they touched the man, they seemed to melt into his body, expanding outwards as whatever Mikade had become grew. Witness my ultimate form and feel how hopelessly outclassed you truly are. Mikade continued to grow, filling up the space and more until he broke through the ceiling of the underworks. It seems I've lost the princess, but no matter. He looked towards the city center where Shibi and Chuja had evacuated the civilians. I know how to draw her out. Minato and Naruto just stared up at the enormous construct Mikade had become helplessly. You got anything to take on something that big? Naruto asked, already anticipating the answer. The boss summon of the toads, maybe, but I don't think I have enough chakra left to summon him. You. Naruto chewed on his cheek for a moment before sighing. Maybe but I've never used it before. I don't even know if it'll work. Minato simply rallied himself, taking a deep breath before giving an encouraging smile. How long do you need? About a minute, I guess. Naruto didn't know himself. Like he said, he had never tried this before. It was only a prototype. He only had it with him because he didn't want to leave it unsupervised back at his building. All the same, Minato kept his grin and nodded resolutely. We'll give you twice that. We, the older blonde simply pointed out of the hole Mikade had created, to where a much larger chooser was taking on the monstrosity bare-handed, almost as tall as the puppet thing himself. In the next moment, Minato vanished, and Naruto heard Mukid's cries of rage as he was pelted by another barrage of shadow clone kunai. Naruto only hesitated a moment before drawing out a small scroll from his jacket pocket. A pulse of chakra, and it expanded into a huge scroll, as tall as he was. He mentally crossed his fingers as he unfurled it. Kami, I hope I'm as smart as I think I am and you actually work. Sarah huffed as she took the stairs two at a time. Why did the Ryumyaku have to be so deep? Behind her, Hanata easily kept pace, those strange eyes of hers apparently keeping watch on the battle above. What's going on? She panted, anxious for news as the two descended ever deeper into the city's depths. It's Mikade. He's become something, else. Something big. I don't think they'll be able to. She was cut off as the entire city seemed to shake, a bright smile suddenly erupting over her features. What? What is it? The Huga simply continued to smile as she turned her attention back to the seemingly endless staircase. She could see the bottom approaching, and behind it, the source of light that hurt her eyes to even look at. It's Naruto. Shibi was a naturally logical man, so when confronted by something that went so far beyond logic it brushed the realms of the fantastical, he did what he did best. He analyzed it. Whatever this form was Mikade was using, it was ridiculously strong if it was able to fend off a full-size chooser. He had seen that man crush mountains with some of his strongest blows. There was a reason the cheerful Akamaiki was often the linchpin of Shikaku's ploys. Mikade was also, apparently, indestructible. He shrugged off all but the worst damage, and healed from that too. Chuza was fending him off for now as Shibi made sure to get the civilians to a safe distance, but soon his curry pill would wear off and he would be just as useless to the fight as Shibi himself was. It seemed like whatever energy comprised the Ryumyaku, his Kikaichu couldn't stomach it. He had lost nearly half of his hive in that ill-fated trap. The moment came and Chuza was forced back, body already rapidly diminishing. Shibi prepared himself to catch the man if need be, 
but the deceptively nimble Akamaiki managed to land in a somewhat shaky three-point stance and dash back over to him, joining him to look up at the looming monstrosity Makade had become. Well, now what? He asked between pants. The curry pill always did a number on him. I imagine that, without reinforcements, we die protecting the civilians, or the others succeed in cutting off the Ryumyaku. Chuza let out a bark of a laugh despite the grim outlook. As bleak as ever, he took a moment to collect himself and puffed his chest out defiantly. All right, never let it be said that an Akamaiki looked at death with nothing less than a full stomach and a grin. Under his high collar, Shibi allowed himself a small smirk. He was friends with the most unusual people. They both turned towards the enormous puppeteer, ready to meet whatever he had to throw at him. Only for Mikade to freeze. Something wrapped an arm around the hulking puppet's neck and pulled, dragging him right off his feet. In a feat of enormous strength Shibi thought was reserved for people like Senju Sunad, whatever had come to their rescue picked Mikade up, holding him over their head, and promptly smashed him down into the ground. The whole city shook from the impact and both Kanoa Shinobi were thrown from their feet. Shibi didn't even bother to get up. He just stared at the newcomer in awe. It was another puppet, that much was clear from the treated wooden veneer. But this construct was as far from Mukid's bulky, lumbering form as designs could get. It seemed to be modeled on a woman, although scaled up at least a hundredfold. More than that, she looked just like the depictions of Asura Shibi had seen in paintings and sculptures. At her size, he could almost believe she was one, complete with four arms and rich ornamentation. She was dressed a richly patterned beaded skirt, huge bangles and bracelets, and a great, glittering diadem atop her braided hair. Although looking closer, her hair was actually a series of interwoven steel cables. The longer he looked, the more little details like that he spotted, that separated this puppet imitation from her divine counterpart. Still, he had never seen a puppet so large before. He didn't even know something that large could even be animated by Chakra, and wondered if that blonde kid had somehow tapped into the Ryumyaku himself. He was shocked from his uncharacteristic days by Minato appearing in front of him in his typical yellow flash. Keep getting the civilians to safety. We've got this. Shibi looked up to see two of the puppet's titanic arms come down in a crushing two-handed blow that rocked the ground and drove Mikade deeper into the crater his body had dug. He couldn't help but agree. Naruto wanted to cry out in pure elation as he watched Asura move. He genuinely couldn't believe his army killer was actually working. His chakra threads glowed a dull, throbbing orange, cutting flaming lines across the sky, but that was unavoidable. The QB's voice, as ever, was a whisper in his ear, but when he didn't also have to contest the pressure of the Ryumyaku and Mukid's will, it was a lot easier to ignore. It helped that he was shunting power into Asura's wooden body so fast that it barely had time to sit and fester inside him. Seeing one of Asura's enormous wooden arms lift high into the sky before slamming down on Mikade was the greatest thrill he had ever known. He was doing something that, to his knowledge, no puppeteer had ever managed. Asura had been the work of years, ever since that first spark of inspiration from his fight with Gara. She was also the first prototype for incorporating chakra wires into his puppets as a sort of artificial chakra system. It was the only reason he was able to even more her titanic form, and it was working like a dream. Mikade tried to pull himself up with a roar of frustration, only for one of Asura's forearms to point down at him. A thousand little compartments all along the limb opened up, spilling out an untold number of kunai. If Minato's little stunt with the shadow clone shuriken technique had looked like a wall of steel, then this was a veritable armory's worth. They were of awful quality, bulk ordered for efficiency, but in these numbers, what did it matter? Mikade fell again under the tidal wave of metal, and for a moment Naruto thought he spotted something crouched in a torn-out section of the monstrosity's chest. It quickly healed over and the two titans clashed again. Standing atop the highest balcony he could find and feeling like a conductor to the world's largest play, Naruto grinned. He couldn't wait to give Asura the full range of testing he had been aching for. Mikade surged forward, his lumbering body crashing right through a nearby tower. Obvious he hadn't expected resistance of this sort as he was clearly surprised when the monolithic puppet met his charge head-on, catching his hands in her own. One of her extra limbs came up in a crushing uppercut while the man was restrained, nearly knocking his great wooden head right off. The other slammed forward, right into his midsection, a huge compartment on the palm opening up. 
The steel capsule it left there was stuffed with enough custom explosive tags to keep Naruto's clones busy for a week, and the detonation did not disappoint. Asura was actually sent staggering back a step from the shockwave, and a nearby weakened tower didn't survive the concussive force, toppling right over on her. The huge puppet lifted two arms to catch it, but in the moment she was caught flat-footed, Mikade charged forward. The man's puppet form was badly damaged, with a great singed crater where his torso used to be, but it didn't seem to slow him down much. With a roar that shook the ground, he shoulder-charged right into Asura, toppling the puppet. He fell on her with a vengeance and Naruto cursed Mikade he grabbed one of her arms. There was enough reinforced wood there to weather a rank jutsu, and the man ripped the limb right off with a grunt of effort. Another fist came up and slammed him in the face, knocking him off the puppet, but the damage was done. Asura moved back a few steps, remaining three arms raised defensively. All the while, Naruto grimaced as he fought to coordinate something he had only theorized before. He was slow, clumsy. Even his strongest efforts would eventually get whittled down if Mikade was allowed continued access to the Ryamyaku. Taking a deep breath, he focused, fingers dancing. Asura paused, two of her arms coming up. The watching shinobi couldn't help but gape as they saw what she was doing, her hands slotting together before coming apart again, faster as Naruto got into the rhythm of it. On the ground, Chuja gaped. He can't be serious. Heavy. Hitsuji. Saru. Ino. Uma. Tora. Katen. Gokaku no Jutsu. Naruto muttered, face twisted in concentration as Asura raised a hand to her mouth in the tiger seal. Everyone in the area felt the sudden pressure of an enormous mass of chakra being molded. There was a flicker of orange at Asura's mouth, but at the last moment she reeled back, something exploding in her chest. Instead of flames, smoke billowed from her mouth and she now listed slightly to the left. From his vantage point Naruto cursed again. He supposed it was too much to ask that would work first time, but it had been worth a go. He simply turned his attention back to keeping Mikade down the old-fashioned way, wondering how the girls were getting on. Damn it, Sarah cursed, slamming her hand on the unyielding stone that stood between them and the source of the Ryamyaku. Why now? The entrance had sealed the moment she approached, the thin slit in the stone that was obviously some kind of keyhole taunting her. Her mother had never mentioned any kind of key. Wait, Hanata muttered, examining the stone and then the chakra blade at her hip. Her Byakugan was deactivated, this close to the source of Roran's power it hurt too much to even look at. It couldn't be. She stepped forward and placed the blade into the slot, her eyes widening when it fit perfectly. She immediately channeled Chakra through the blade and felt something, but the door remained immovable as ever. Sarah immediately moved to help, placing her hand over Hanata's. The moment she touched it, the Chakra surged out of the blade and through the door, lighting up the wall for a moment before it ground open, revealing the cavern beyond. Yes, come on, she called, already running forward. As they passed the threshold the cavern shook violently as another titanic tremor rocked the city. Hanata gave a worried look up as they jogged. Just a little longer Naruto-kun. It was a lot harder controlling Asura from the ground, but after Mikade had come after him, destroying his balcony vantage, he hadn't been offered much choice in the matter. He was beginning to flag, the slow burn of the Kyuubi's chakra beginning to wear on him. Maybe if he hadn't tried that full stunt with the Jasu, he may have been doing better, but in the end it wouldn't matter much anyway. They were mortal, their energy limited. Mikade didn't seem to suffer any such disadvantages. Asura was missing another arm now, not to mention the numerous gashes and rents along her body. She had been doing an admirable job, perfect even, for a prototype he had never expected to see real combat, but slowly, the damage was stacking up. Minato appeared next to him. The man had been running interference as best he could, diverting blows that would have crippled the puppet into simply damaging it, but even he was beginning to wilt. Were running out of time, he stated matter-of-factly. He was right too. Asura wouldn't last another few minutes, and Naruto couldn't go on much longer than that himself. With a body like that, it wouldn't take long for Mikade to simply dig his way down to the Ryamyaku source, and if he managed that, they were done for. Sure enough, as if sensing how tired his opponents were, the man puppet grinned, slamming his fists into one of the many large craters that littered the city. It deepened, and when the man struck it again, it became obvious that was exactly what he was doing. Damn, Minato cursed, face scrunched up in thought. What you attempted earlier, with the jutsu. What went wrong? 
Naruto was caught off guard by the strange question, busy moving Asura forward to pull Mikade back and away from the hole he was digging. It was too much. I couldn't concentrate on forming the jutsu and keeping Asura stable through it, the chakra pathways aren't developed enough. If the future Hokage was surprised Naruto had managed to give a puppet a chakra system, he didn't show it, simply thinking deeply. If someone else were to form the jutsu then. Naruto just blinked. Maybe. But it would have to be with somebody whose chakra was highly compatible. Minato gave the teen a compassionate look. I think we both know that won't be a problem, will it? Naruto said nothing, gritting his teeth. A moment later and he held out a hand, Asura suffering from the sudden loss of half his control. Minato nodded, placing his hand on Naruto's and focusing, pure chakra beginning to swirl between their palms. Defeat Mikade now, figure out how to get you back to your own time later, right? Naruto barely heard him, focusing on the feel of the man's chakra as it reacted with his own. It was warm. He simply allowed it to happen, translating the jutsu by feel to his puppet. Asura took a step back, bracing herself as her hands came together. Chakra swirled to life between her palms. It was blinding, the noise incredible. The winds it picked up were enough to buffet the pair of shinobi, but they didn't relent. The technique grew in Asura's hands, larger, wider, until it resembled a miniature sun, pulsing excitedly. Naruto grit his teeth as he fought to stabilize the technique, feeling Minato's years of experience with the jutsu flow through him, a guiding hand. With a final gasp of effort Naruto took a step forward, Asura copying him perfectly. Minato let go and for a terrifying moment he thought it wouldn't be enough, that he would lose control. But the titanic Rasengan held, swirling violently, but controlled. Naruto allowed himself that one, single moment of pure elation before grinning viciously. So in, Okibo Rasengan, Asura stepped in, driving her Rasengan forward. It struck Mikade right in the back, nearly obliterating the whole construct in one, titanic blast of energy. But Naruto didn't stop. Asura pressed on, drilling the technique down harder, crushing whatever might be left of the man along with the deepening crater the technique was creating. Naruto could feel the chakra wires in Asura's arm burn out, overloaded by the energy. Even then, he didn't relent. Finally, in blast that seemed to light the entire city white for a single moment, the Rasengan destabilized, expanding for just a moment before winking out. Asura's arm was wrecked, shorn clean away up to the elbow. It was the straw that broke the camel's back, and the divinely modeled construct slumped to the side, unknowingly mimicking her creator. Naruto panted on his knees, just barely keeping his head up to look at the damage that one technique had wrought. Even Minato looked stunned for a moment before he collected himself. Well, that'll do it, the older blonde managed, moving over to help Naruto stand. No. Naruto shook his head. I felt it at the end. He's still connected to the Ryamyaku. It's not over yet. Minato's face fell slightly before he took a deep breath and reset his features. It was incredible that he still had that much emotional control even after all of this. This really was a man who would one day be Hokage. It was sort of inspiring. Naruto thought he would have appreciated it more if he didn't feel so burned out. As always, the QB had taken his toll for usurping his power. He didn't envy future Naruto his headache. He chuckled slightly at his own internal pun as he dragged himself to his feet, running forward with Minato to survey the damage and figure out what happened to Mikade. Hanata didn't jump. She wasn't the wide-eyed, skittish waif she had once been. But that didn't make her shock any less pronounced when the whole whole room shook again, this time much, much closer. Sarah had just crouched down next to the Ryamyaku source, a strange carved eye in the ground that's iris shone with that now familiar purple light, when the ceiling gave way. Something fell through the dust and the rubble, impacting with the skinny stone bridge hard enough to take a chunk out of it. Hanata's heart fell. It was Mikade. Her only solace was that he was back to that original, insectoid form. Naruto and the others had managed to give them that much of an advantage. She spotted Sarah freeze in the periphery of her vision. Keep going, she said, surprised at how steady her own voice was. It was only then that she realized that she wasn't afraid, that her body had almost instinctually slipped into her combat stance. Sarah blinked at the command, before nodding and returning to whispering to the carved eye. It almost sounded like a lullaby. Mikade moved forward on his skittering centipede legs, a baleful look on his wooden features, but Hanata stayed firm. 
He barely took two steps before two silhouettes following him through the opening in the ceiling. You're really just like a cockroach, aren't you Mikade? Naruto called out tiredly, looking battered and worn. Still, it seemed nothing could snuff out the resilient glint in his eye and Hanata's heart soared at the sight of it. The puppet thing growled in frustration but continued his charge forward, so close to his goal. But at that moment Hanata heard the grind of stone on stone as the carved eye behind her closed. Mikade screamed in anger, his body falling away around him until nothing but the chubby, pale form of Anrokuzan crawled out, glaring at Sarah murderously. You fool of a princess, what have you done? I could have had the world. All of it. Mine. Hanata wasn't sure what overcame her at that moment. Perhaps it was the combined stress of the whole situation finally getting to her, or just the way Mikade was looking at Sarah. Whatever it was, it compelled her to cross the two paces between them and lash out violently, striking Mikade clean across the cheek with her foot. It was quite possibly the most unhuger thing she had ever done, and it felt incredible. His head was snapped to the side, his body sprawling. The bridge must have been weakened by the impact of his body more than they thought, because when he put a hand down to steady himself, he only succeeded in breaking a piece of the masonry off. His face didn't even have time to look surprised before his body went tumbling over the edge, a lone scream of shock following him down until that too was snuffed out as he dropped into the swirling purple light that swam around the small stone island. The Raimyaku itself, Hanata presumed. There was a moment of calm before the room shook again, this time to the very foundations as the previously calm light below them turned into a roiling mass of red and black, tainted by Mukid's hatred and deaths. Rubble and debris fell from the weakening walls as the three shinobi rushed over to the island, where Sarah stared at the source in terrified confusion. I don't understand, I should have cut off the source. Minato took one look at the closed eye on the ground and grimaced. You've cut off the primary access point, but not the source itself. It'll have to be sealed completely. As if to punctuate his point, the room shook again and a huge chunk of the ceiling crashed down next to the startled princess. But, she hovered for a moment, uncertain. Naruto knew it must have been a painful decision. Without the Ryumyaku, Roran would effectively cease to exist as a city. If she left it though, she risked the lives of her citizens. When boiled down to that crystalline decision, it was no choice at all. She shored herself up and nodded at the blonde resolutely. You're it. Minato nodded and moved over to the source faster than most could blink, already rushing through hand seals with one of his kunai in hand, the kunai he had given Naruto. The young puppeteer hadn't even noticed him take it back. Finishing on the ram seal, he plunged the tri-pronged weapon into the eye, sinking it in like it was thick mud and not solid stone. A huge matrix of inked kanji spread out around the weapon, pulsing excitedly for a moment. Then, nothing. The quaking stopped and the swirling, turbulent energy around them quietened until it vanished altogether. The cavernous room now looked almost identical to how the Kanoa team had found it in the future. Naruto was about to remark something, only to look down and notice that his hand was glowing softly with white light. Hanata too. W what's going on? Sarah asked clearly confused. Hanata just smiled softly at her. No need to panic, we're just, going home. The young princess eyes widened into sources. Are you, angels? Naruto couldn't help it. The moment she said it, he burst out laughing. It was strange. Not a day ago and he would have never allowed himself such an open gesture of genuine emotion. He told himself it was the exhaustion. Minato's reaction was more subdued. He smiled at the younger blonde. I suspected something like this would happen once we sealed the Ryumyaku. Now that we've set everything back on course, you should be pulled back to your own time. He looked down, suddenly uncertain. This may be the last chance we get to talk. Is there anything you want to say? Something uncomfortable squirmed in Naruto's guts when he heard that, accompanied by the all too genuine look from Min, from his father. His mouth opened and closed wordlessly for a few seconds before he let out a deep breath and gave a tired smirk. Not to this you. Minato nodded understandingly pulling out a small ceiling scroll that Naruto recognized, at least in theory. He had been afraid of this. Then there's only one thing left to do. Hanata stared at the future Hokage inquisitively, but Naruto's features were much grimmer. Is wiping our memories really necessary? He knew it was standard procedure for these rare types of events which, weirdly enough, told him this happened enough to be made procedure. It's for all our safety. Knowledge of time travel is dangerous for anybody. 
for you maybe, Naruto counted, subtly moving a hand behind his back. Knowledge of the future, even implied. That's dangerous. But knowledge of a resolved past. What can we do with that? Minato just smiled sadly. Sorry Naruto. I have two. He moved to bring his hands together and Naruto threw out his own. Wait. He pulled out a scroll. I have to destroy my puppets. I can't let anybody find them and have them reverse engineered. Minato hesitated, and that was enough. As Naruto pulled out the scroll that allowed him to remotely detonate his puppets, he slipped in the smaller one he had been sketching behind his back. When he passed Chakra through them, a tiny chain of kanji slithered up his arm, curling around the back of his head, hidden by his hair. His and Hanata's bodies continued to shine brighter, and Minato wasted no more time, slamming his hands down and extending another ring of fuinjutsu that encompassed all of them. The last thing Naruto saw was the assembled civilians they had freed, crowded on the other side of the cavern. It seemed they had come to see if everything was over. They were calling things, but a ringing had started up in his ears and he couldn't make out what they were saying. Still, the energy of the crowd was obvious. They were cheering for them. Thanking them. It was a, new experience, for the team. Being recognized. Being appreciated. It was that feeling that filled him as the glow around his body became blinding and he was thrown forward in time. So, you remember nothing? The Hockage asked, brow furrowed thoughtfully. Naruto and Hanata both shook their heads. Sasuke stood off to the side, his part done. Hokage sama with respect, Hanata piped in, voice wavering. She might have been able to stand up to Mikade, although she wouldn't remember it, but the Hokage was a whole different matter. I'm not sure there's anything to remember. The Sandime looked to Naruto for confirmation. The blonde chose his words carefully. I have to agree. Mikade was interfering with the Fuinjutsu containing what we suspect to have been the Ryamyaku, then there was some kind of explosion. Both of us, he motioned at Hanata, remember feeling like we were forgetting something. He made sure to ask her experience of the whole event in advance to get his own story straight. But I suspect that might just be a lingering effect of tampering with an advanced space-time Fuinjutsu. The explanation should hold. From an outsider's perspective, Sasuke's, to be exact, the white light had engulfed them all only to recede and leave them lying in the center of the platform, Mikade nowhere in sight. Naruto had thought it best not to reveal the fact that he remembered the entire affair, he was still unpacking it himself. The Hokage checked the file in front of him and nodded slowly. There have been no further sightings of Mikade since the incident, so I suspect he was likely destroyed by his ill-fated ambitions. If there's nothing further, he looked up, scanning all three of them, but received nothing but blank stares, then for now, I believe we can call this mission a success. He gave a dismissive wave that told the three ninja it was time to leave, only to raise a hand. Oh, Hanata, I'd like you to stay for a moment. Spotting her panicked look, he simply gave a well-worn, grandfatherly smile. No need to panic my dear. I'd just like to have a chat about your recent performance. Naruto looked back over his shoulder with a smirk. He remembered his own, performance review, a few days before his promotion to Junin. Good for her. She may not remember all that she had done in Roran, but she deserved at least this much. For a moment, his eyes lingered on the portrait suspended behind the Hokage's desk, Minato calmly looking back at him with a confident smile, then he turned and walked out. Naruto threw his jacket on his workbench as he came in, smiling to himself, he wasn't even sure about what. The successful mission, meeting his father, pulling one over on the Hokage. It just seemed like a time to be in a good mood. Damn. If I don't have a story for you, he said as he passed Hanabi, reading a book on her bed. She gave a disinterested grunt and he put on his best faux pout. Come on, it has time travel and everything. The young Hugo merely looked up from her book, leveled a cold glare at him, then returned to her reading. It reminded him of why exactly she might have been upset with him. It was like a splash of cold water over his good mood. He glanced at where Neji's body was stored and glared at it as if the offending scroll would just up and disappear on its own. Nope, still there. He must have looked foolish, standing there in the middle of the room, staring at the wall blankly. He thought through all of those various rationalizations that had gone through his head a hundred times since the problem was put on his shoulders, admittedly, by himself. Suddenly, they seemed trivial against one, inscrutable fact. Hanabi was right. If he went through with it and stole Neji's eyes, that would be one step too far down a dark path. 
What was a material advantage against the cost of his humanity? He had seen it twice now. Sasori. Mikade. People just like him, on the same path, willing to throw away what made him human in favor of power. Did he want that to be him? The sight of all of those people calling out to him in Roran, cheering, thanking him. Would they have behaved that way if he was some inhuman thing instead? If he were a monster? Painful childhood memories he thought he had moved past invaded his thoughts. Mutters and whispers just out of earshot. Demon. Monster. Would he really give in and become what everyone already thought he was? Was that who he was? Someone who couldn't even endure that much. And suddenly, the quandary that had weighed on his mind for months lifted, just like that. What if I said you could leave? He asked abruptly and, despite doing her best to ignore him, the question hit Hanabi way out of left field, stunning her. W what? She blinked, before glaring at him, wary of some kind of cruel joke. That's it, you would just let me go. Of course not, Naruto shot back. She would go out and expose him, undoing the change he was trying to make in his life. Her face instantly fell and his lips twisted slightly at the misunderstanding. I've been recently reminded that there are certain few injutsu that can remove memories. If you want, I could apply one to you, and release both you and Neji. It wasn't really the perfect solution. If somebody caught an inkling of what he had done, a determined enough seal master could easily bring the memories back. It was why he hadn't considered it before. Just like that. Just like that, he confirmed with a nod. All you'll have lost is time. Hanabi's brow furrowed, and he knew her worries all too well. If somebody offered him the same deal, he wasn't sure what he would do. It would be giving up the chance to escape on her own, in exchange for all that she had learnt, all that she had grown in the past year and a bit. And you would release Neji too. I should be able to work something out. Another reason he hadn't considered this plan earlier, he hadn't had a credible plant in the Cloud Village to make it feasible. I know it's asking a lot to trust me but... No. Hanabi cut in quickly, surprising the blonde with the authenticity of her tone. No. If I trust you to do anything, it's at least be honest with me. The entire time she had been his captive, she didn't think Naruto had told her a single lie. Purposefully kept things from her and used half-truths to slant events in his favor, sure, but never an outright falsehood. She had stood at the surprise of his offer, but now sat, bringing her hands together in a way Naruto had seen Hanata make a hundred times when nervous or thoughtful. He knew the decision was a tough one, but he honestly hadn't expected this much thought from the girl. I should point out, Naruto cut into her musing, that regardless of what you choose, I'll be releasing Neji, so I won't really be able to make this offer twice. Pretending to sneak both Hyuga captives out of Kumo once. Doable doing it with Neji, and then Hanabi again at a later date. That would raise a lot more questions than he was comfortable answering. Or, more accurately, than he was currently able to cover up. The insight didn't seem to do much to ease Hanabi's choice, and the girl continued to stare at the ground, silent. Naruto could at least leave her to her thoughts, and moved across the room to his desk to get started on his full mission summary from the Roran incident, just as heavily docted as his first-hand account. He was just finishing up when Hanabi stood, her face a maelstrom of emotion that she fought to restrain. I, I think I want to stay. Naruto was about to comment, to ask her if she was sure, but she apparently preempted it. Don't patronize me. His mouth snapped shut. I've thought about it, and for everything I've lost being your captive, there's also been things I've gained. Things I never would have learned with my family. She choked back a strangled sort of sob, the weight of her decision catching up to her. You know, it's weird. I'm in captivity, a prisoner, and yet oddly, I've never felt freer. Free from responsibility. Free from the decision that would have torn me and my sister apart. Free from all the damn politics. Her eyes hardened and she blinked back tears. Make no mistake, this she leveled directly at him, I will get back to my family one day. But I won't lose a year of my life to do it. She glanced at the place where he kept Neji's scroll, allowing herself a slightly watery smile. Besides, even though I said I trust you, this is really the only way I can make sure you follow through on your promise, right? She reared back, almost regressing to those first few days again as she did her best to look imperious. But you understand perfectly well what I'm giving up here, so, so I want to make a deal. Naruto raised an eyebrow, but did his best to keep the amusement off his face. 
it wasn't really the time for mocking, although he struggled not to point out she wasn't exactly in a bargaining position. I'll, I'll stay, and in the future, when I get out of here, I won't tell people what you did. In exchange, she seemed to struggle with it a moment, before taking a calming breath. In exchange, I want you to train me. You want me to what? You heard me, she shot back tersely, catching herself a moment later and reining herself back in. I want to learn what makes you so strong. So, teach me how to be a puppeteer. The Bond blinked incredulously. He had never even thought about teaching somebody else puppeteering, never mind his Hugo captives. Hell, he wasn't even sure he was far along enough in his art to even consider being ready to teach it. Still, while Hanabi was indeed in no position to make demands, she was right. He did understand what she was giving up. And he had made a pseudo-promise to himself to start at least trying to do better. And she had asked for it. I won't go easy on you. The girl huffed, the haughty image somewhat marred by her reddened eyes. As if I would expect anything less. Naruto considered it all for a moment. It wasn't too late to simply slap a seal on the back of her head and rid himself of the problem once and for all. But that little voice in the back of his mind, the one that always encouraged him to explore the most interesting things, coincidentally the voice that got him into the most trouble, was whispering in his ear. All right, but you'll have to call me Naruto-sensei. Never. We'll work on that. For now, learning from doing. When she looked at him inquisitively he grinned a toothy smile. We're going to plan an escape from Kumo. Things had been going so well, too. The plan with Neji had, against all the odds, and the worries, and the fears, gone off without a hitch. It was about as simple as they come. He had managed to weasel the patrol routes of a certain Chunin squad out of a desk jockey that owed him a favor, by proxy of course. He never did these things in person, or even gave any acknowledgement that it was him all these people owed favors to. From there, it was a simple matter to leave Neji's unconscious body along their paths. He was spirited back to the village the moment he was found and was currently recuperating in the hospital. Of course, when asked, he wouldn't be able to tell anybody exactly what happened, because there was nothing to tell. He had been unconscious, bound in a scroll for the past year. Naruto even heard that Jiraiya was brought in to check for a memory seal, which made him actually kind of glad Hanabi had rejected his offer, they might have given her a once-over as well, just to be sure. He'd had all ears straining for any news on that front, and hadn't been disappointed. From what he was able to piece together, the upper echelons decided this was a strategic move from Kumo. A peace offering of sorts in the final days of the war. That was good. If they brought it up at the negotiating table, Kumo would deny it vehemently, just as they would deny that they had Hanabi. The fact that Neji's body was, left, and not delivered would give the other village plausible deniability. It would leave tension simmering between the cloud and the Hugo over the fate of Hanabi, exacerbated by the fact that, behind more secure doors, the Hockage believed Kumo had simply given up trying to break the caged bird seal when they already had the younger heir. But the rift between the Hugo and Kumo wasn't one that would have easily closed anyway. Even then, if he ever did find a way of introducing Hanabi back to the village, after ensuring his secrets were 100% secure, he had a plan in the works. Already he was using the instability of the war to send out feelers into the militaristic village, hoping to get a few new hooks in for the future. That was where the good news ended. In an unprecedented move that caught just about everyone in Kanoa's brass off guard, Suna had turned around and betrayed them, again. On one of the joint ops between the two villages, the team that Suna sent had turned on the Kanoa squad, slaughtering them in their sleep. In the same night, Suna Nin had descended on a number of Kanoa protected villages, thought safe from Kumo in the south of the country. It wasn't a crippling blow, but it was a hell of a way to declare war. A few people suspected it was to entice Kumo back into the fight, so the two villages could gang up on the weakened Kanoa. Perhaps if they had, Iwa might have joined in too, slicing up Hino Kuni between their three ambitions. Luckily, Despite the man's propensity for brash decision, it seemed the rakage was no fool. He knew when to cut his losses, and the official declaration of ceasefire had come the very next day. Naruto thought it far more likely he was just sitting back, waiting to see how this played out. So, the attack continued to make no sense, until every fire country boat out on the eastern ocean had been abruptly sunk at once. If nobody had been expecting Suna's betrayal, then the sudden movement from Kirigakur was completely outside of the calculations.
As far as anybody else was aware, they were still embroiled in a bitter civil war. The sudden turn to attack Kanoa, with Suna of all allies, was unthinkable. And yet, here they were. Naruto was currently trying to piece it all together, staring up at the board that, ironically, had once housed his collected plans for starting this war. Now it contained detailed maps and logs of operations and counter-operations going back as far as a month before Suna's betrayal. He didn't know it, but if Okami had walked in at that moment, the wolf-masked Anbu would have found it almost eerily similar to the planning board contained in the Anbu headquarters. A complicated series of strings linked various logs, making sense only to Naruto's chaotic mind, but even with the visual aid, the team just couldn't find the impetus for all of this. Despite the attempts on him, which were more personal than anything, that at least he understood, Tsuna had been pretty much on the road to recovery. Kanoa had been lending their unseen aid in getting the Daimyo to start looking more internally instead of outsourcing his missions. It cut into Kanoa's profits a little, but so did war. A large red circle was scribbled around a small picture of a familiar red-haired face. It had surprised him when Suna had elected their supposedly volatile young Jinchuriki as Kazekage. It was a nearly unprecedented move that seemed entirely hinged on the fact that Suna was painfully lacking in high-level shinobi, and a sudden switch in said Jinchuriki's outlook since the Chunin exams more than a year ago. It seemed irrelevant now. About three weeks ago the kid had abruptly gone missing, after reports of some kind of large-scale attack during the night that, curiously enough, appeared to have caused no damage to the village whatsoever. It was right before his inauguration and had thrown Suna into chaos. It was the closest thing he could imagine to a cause for all of this, but it would take some kind of twisted logic to pin that on Kanoa. And that still didn't explain Kirigakur's involvement. Things on that front were a great deal more frustrating, mostly due to the fact he knew so little about the village hidden in the mist. Precious little information came out of Mizu no Kuni during the civil war engulfing the country, and the curtain only seemed to have tightened. Kanoa was beginning to gear up for their counter-operations even as he thought this, but now fighting a war on two fronts, their tactics had to change. Suna was a known entity and plans had been in place to crush them since the first invasion with Otogaku. Kiri was the bigger enigma and the top minds were putting most of their resources into ending that threat quickly before even more entities could be dragged into this ever-increasing shitshow. For the first time since he orchestrated his, little, ploy, Naruto regretted his actions. They had spiraled too far outside of his purview, and it was only now, when he was racking his brain for any way he could help put an end to it, that he realized he had been playing with things way outside of his skill to contain. He was currently throwing his weight to get himself on any and all relevant missions to Kiri, for all the good it did him. The two he had been on already were useless. A scouting mission, barely breaking a mile into the coast, that had told him, and Kanoa, nothing. Another that had him investigating some of the wrecks Kiri had sunk as their opening move. Nothing, again, except what they already knew. He was going to have to be more discerning about which missions he pulled for. It wasn't hard to manufacture a reason looking for some exotic flora and fauna for new poisons and anti-poisons. It was hardly like the hospital, and by extension the mission office, could say no. With Sunad out of the village doing Kami knew what, it was highly likely that he was actually the foremost expert on poisons and the derivatives in the village. The realization hadn't pleased him nearly as much as it would have a short while ago. He made a mental note to actually do some of that while he was scouting for his own reasons. Kanoa was well versed with the venom and plant-based poisons Suna used, but Kanoa and Kiri clashed so rarely they were essentially an unknown at this point. He would have to start getting the hospital to send him samples of poison tissue as they inevitably came in. The grim thought made him frown as he turned back to his planning board. It was starting to get a little complex, even for him, but there was a nagging suspicion that he was missing something just out of sight. You know, for a teacher, You've done a lot more staring at that board than actually, you know, teaching. Hanabi called through ground teeth, trying to latch her all too visible chakra strings onto the worn anatomical marionette in front of her. It was the very same one Naruto had first practiced with. When he didn't answer she rolled her eyes. Naruto sensei. He turned and gave her that insufferable grin, quickly glancing down at her work with eyes that could deconstruct in seconds what it took her days to grasp. I already told you, fray the strings at the end, use that to latch onto the wood. With a puppet that basic, seals weren't even required, you could move the wood manually. What does that even mean? 
She complained. He shrugged. It was actually somewhat surprising how difficult his skills were to translate into instruction. As a kid, learning this on his own, he had reached most of these conclusions by accident, replicating them later by how they felt. Actually explaining the counterintuitive process of focusing on the ends of the strings until they lost focus was a challenge. You're spinning the chakra into strings, so simply focus on the tension right at the very tips and, release it. Hanabi grunted and tried again, flicking the strings up so they brushed the little puppet. She had no problem controlling the chakra itself, her control was definitely better than his was when he first tried the same thing, it was the mental focus she seemed to struggle with. One of her fingers twitched and, to her surprise more than anything, the little doll's arm moved forward. Yes. Her enthusiasm had Naruto smiling as she quickly ignored him and focused on replicating her achievement. He quashed the small annoyance at the fact that something which took him months had taken her less than a week. He wasn't going to let his own pride get in the way of fixing one of his newly emerged regrets. And speaking of which, he sighed as he looked at the clock. He had been putting this off for too long anyway. I'm going out, he called softly, his voice not even breaking through the sudden bubble of pure concentration Hanabi now wore as she tried to get the doll to take a tremulous step forward. At least somebody was having fun. Sakura's grave was just as wholly unremarkable as the other polished granite slabs that dotted the cemetery in neat, orderly rows. Was it a grave? He wasn't sure. It was just a shallow box in the ground holding her ashes. Nobody was buried in Kanoa, they didn't have the space for a big graveyard like that. Shinobi that died were interred here for about two years before their ashes were returned their families, or failing that, spread somewhere in the surrounding forest as fertilizer. It was supposed to be symbolic of, even in death, their hearts going towards keeping the village safe and secure. In all honesty, it was just the most practical thing to do. Sakura's time was almost up. They had already engraved her name into the memorial stone in training ground three and in the next few days a Chunin team would come by, dig up the temporary grave and return the ashes, and the granite plaque, to her family. Most chose to follow the tradition of spreading the ashes, a few decided to keep them in an urn. Naruto personally thought the latter was a bit grim. Who wanted the constant reminder of that kind of loss? He stood in front of the little plaque awkwardly, noting that somebody had left flowers here a few days ago. They were starting to wilt. I, I don't regret it, I don't think, he started. It was the first thing he'd said since coming out here and standing in silence for a good ten minutes. There were a few others in the graveyard, no doubt mourning more recent internments from the war. There was an unspoken agreement in the quiet air to leave everyone to their individual business. He'd have nobody listening in here. I really don't, he repeated, wondering just who he was trying to convince. I don't like how it all turned out and, in hindsight, I may have, should have, done things differently. But, I'm not really here to make excuses. I just wanted to say, I wish I could have changed things. I wish I had known then what I know now, that I was strong enough then that you didn't have to die at all. He gave a wan smile. I've only spoken to Kakashi Sensei a few times since. Called me over himself. Wasn't late or anything. He chuckled as if he was remembering Sakura's shy smile, the one she gave when suppressing how much something made her want to laugh. Usually, because she didn't want to look silly in front of Sasuke. It was amazing what you noticed and disregarded when trying to work out the best way to manipulate somebody. Surprising, right. The smile ebbed. He told me not to blame myself, and I don't. There's nothing I really could have done. But still. He sighed, a deep, cleansing breath. I used to have a crush on you, you know. I'm not sure if you ever even noticed. It faded after a while, probably because of my own apathy. Everything else seemed so insignificant besides puppets back then. He chuckled humorously. Might never properly get over that, all things considered. Old habits etc. When we were put on the same team, I didn't really think much about it, except how to best use it for my advantage. He looked up, blinking. Kami, I sound like such a little asshole looking back now. I thought you were totally useless, only good for practicing my limited abilities with manipulation. Then you started picking up medical ninjutsu so quickly, and you were interesting again. The wan smile returned. I really did want to see how far you could go with it. Guess we'll never find out now. His tongue clicked against the roof of his mouth. It's only been a recent thing, all this nostalgia. I occasionally wonder what you would be like now. How strong you might have become. 
Hell, for all I know, you might have just gotten yourself killed somewhere down the line anyway. A part of me is berating myself, saying, what's the point of thinking about what ifs? It's sort of right. Can't change the past, and believe me, I've been in a position too. He winked at the grave, feeling his grin falter a little. Let's keep that between you and me. He sighed again, running a hand through his hair. I can almost understand why Kakashi does this so often. It's kind of cathartic. He looked back down. Anyway, I know this is long overdue, and I've been putting it off for Kami knows how long, but I'm here now, just about as late as I can be. He shared one last chuckle with his old teammate and glanced up at the sky again. The clouds were starting to darken, it would probably rain soon. Guess I did learn something from Kakashi Sensei after all. He almost had to grab his hand to stop it from running through his messy hair again. That was almost becoming a habit, and even the most innocuous habits could get a ninja killed. Anyway, I just wanted to say, sorry. For what? I'll leave up to you. There's probably more than I can put into words anyway. He turned to leave, and nearly walked straight into Ino. Oh, oh, Naruto. I didn't see, I didn't expect anybody else to be here. There was an undercurrent of accusation in her tone, but it was subdued. She seemed far from the fiery, headstrong girl he had known at the academy. He had sort of, lost track of her, after the whole preliminaries incident. He knew she hadn't stopped being a ninja, but other than that, he had no idea what she had been doing this whole time. They had never even been assigned to a mission together. Kami, how awful was that? He never even bothered to look up the girl whose life he had potentially ruined when he made her believe she killed her best friend. Naruto had come here today expecting to vent and relieve some of his guilt, not to pile on more. Things, kept getting in the way. Ino's eyes seemed to flash for a moment, incensed, before she took a step back, the bouquet in her hands drooping to her side. Well, that explained where the flowers came from. I guess I can understand that, you two were on the same team together after all. It must have been hard. Every word seemed to twist the knife in his heart a little more. Were they on the same team? Could he even call it that? Just came to pay my respects, before it was too late. He made to move past her, and she almost seemed ready to let him, but he was rarely so lucky. Before he could even make it to the next row she turned. Wait, Naruto. He turned, uncertain of what to expect, only to find her standing there, idly fiddling with the bouquet. Some of the people from our graduating year were planning a get-together, a celebration of sorts. What with Hanata being made Junin recently, and Neji coming back. Naruto's lips twitched. Nobody had thrown him any celebration when he was promoted. The most he had gotten was a sarcastic congratulation from Hanabi, and that hardly counted. Still, being bitter was sort of counter to intentions he had come here with. I didn't realize you were close to him. He didn't realize Neji was close to anyone. He had been a standoffish, deprecating snob. I wasn't, she explained, but when Shikamaru and Lee were promoted, his teammate, Tenten, was placed with our team for the next exams. We stayed in touch and got pretty friendly. She gave the same, humorless kind of smile he had been sharing with Sakura. To be honest, I'm going more for her than for him. She said it almost conspiratorially, as if she was sharing this secret just with him. He knew the trust-fostering tactic well, and was certain she likely didn't even realize what she was doing. From what he knew, that's just what Yamanaka were like. Plus, Hanata really needs the support right now. I think having Neji back has reopened the wound with her sister, so getting her nice and drunk to forget is my way of helping. Only good intentions, huh? He said, dryly. She gave an impish grin, revealing that under the recently acquired maturity, her core hadn't changed. So. What do you say? After graduation, you pretty much dropped off the map for most of us. I bet a whole bunch of people would like to catch up. He wasn't so sure about that. He could count the friends he had in the academy on his fingers, and still have two hands spare. He was about to politely decline, only to find his lips working entirely outside of his control. Sure. He blinked, incredulous, completely uncertain why he had said that. Oh, oh okay, cool. We'll see you at my place then, later tonight. Apparently, Ino hadn't been expecting the answer either. And suddenly Naruto wasn't the battle-hardened Junin his flak jacket signified. He was an awkward 15-year-old, suddenly anxious that he had invited himself along to a place he wasn't welcome. Yeah. Damn rebellious mouth. 
That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.